So welcome once more to the audience here, to the audience online, um, to uh, Kara who's helping out here, to Farida who's helping out somewhere else to make it all work, and of course to our speaker uh, Hashmanda, who today will talk on the crisis of India's democracy. I'm Jens Lerke, I'm from the Department of Development Studies, and this is a joint seminar organized by the Department of Development Studies and the South Asia Institute here at SOAS. Um, I will start by briefly introducing Hashmanda, and then uh, it's for him to, to deliver the main talk, uh, after which we will have a hopefully long and interesting question and answer and discussion session. And that is the plan for this evening, late afternoon. Okay, Hashmanda is, as we probably all know, a human rights and peace worker. He's also a writer, columnist, researcher and teacher, and he works with the survivors of mass violence, hunger, homeless persons and street children. He's the, he's, the, he's the chairperson of the Center for Equity Studies in Delhi. And he's currently a Richard von Weizsäcker Fellow uh, of the Robert Bosch Academy in Berlin. He holds a PhD from Rigi University in Amsterdam. He's a distinguished scholar with the Initiative of Political Conflict, Gender and People rights, People's Rights at UCLA in Berkeley. And he, and he regularly writes for concerned media outlets in India and has written more than 25 books. He actually retired from the civil service in 2002 in protest against the role of the state in, communal, in the communal massacre in Gujarat. And that he went on to found uh, Aman Biradari, a people's campaign for secular, peaceful, just and humane world as a reaction to the communal carnage. Um, in 2017, he established and, and led the important national initiative, Karawan e Mohabbat, or Caravan of Love, which tries to counter rising hate and fear in the country with love and solidarity. The Caravan visits the families of those uh, who lost loved ones to hate, violence, and lynching for atonement, solidarity, healing, conscience, and justice, and to provide goodwill and trust between communities not the least. He's also a founding member of the National People's Rights to Information, and he has held several positions uh, at, 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 at some more official level. He was a member of the Prime Minister's National Advisory Council to, to 2010 to 12, and he was a special commissioner to the Supreme Court of India in the rights to food case from 2005 to 2017. He's also made many significant interventions in India's high courts. Uh, and through that, he has had a direct impact on many aspects of some of the most pressing social issues in India, including begging, the impunity of perpetrators of violence in Gujarat, and citizenship related, uh, citizenship rights related cases. So, it therefore, should come to as no surprise that the Peace Research Institute in Oslo included him in its 2022 shortlist of people recommended for the Nobel Peace Prize as well. So this is just a very brief introduction, but I think it, it just, as I say, we probably all know a lot of this already because Hashmanda is, is a well-known uh, activist and, 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 uh, and, and so it engages on so many different fronts. But this is nevertheless just a, a brief introduction to, to enable us to understand in a sense the gravity of what we are going to to, to listen to soon uh, the, 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 the presentation on the crisis of injust democracy as we get here is from someone who has, who has worked in this field and been active in this field and whose voice has been heard both nationally and internationally in so many ways and taken seriously in so many ways up until now. And so therefore it matters. Over to you, Hash. Thank you, Jens. Um, um those uh, generous words and uh, thank you all of you for, for gathering here. Uh, I was terrified that this would be an empty hall, um, but it's nice to see uh, many of you, including dear friends. Um, what I have to speak about is extremely grim. Uh, uh, as I prepared for, for this conversation, just putting down my thoughts, uh, the enormity of what we are confronting uh, sort of came back to me. Um, 
So I hope uh, I, uh, Jens is going to discipline me by keeping me in time. And I hope we have enough time for a conversation as well. There are signs all around us of our world in tumult. Uh, democracy and fraternity are being slowly but surely snuffed out in many parts of our world by a rising politics of hate. Leaders in both electoral democracies and authoritarian states are increasingly legitimizing hatred and bigotry, thereby hollowing out democracy and eroding the ideas of equal citizenship and fraternity. If you're a minority of any kind, religious, racial, ethnic, caste, gender, class, a life with dignity and security has become increasingly precarious in most parts of our world today. We today inhabit a world in which the odds are high that your neighbor will not look like you, worship like you, speak your language, eat, dress, sing, dance, love like you. The question this raises is how will we respond to people we feel are different? Are we welcoming, curious, friendly? Or are we fearful, resentful, and full of hate? Few countries in the world today are immune from the rise of far-right leaders who encourage the second path, who foster fear and hate against people of different faiths, skin colors, uh, beliefs, ways of life. I sit here today to talk to you about my own country, India, and its many crises of democracy. India's democracy was never perfect, but even with its flaws, it was robust, vibrant, colorful, assertive, with largely free elections, an independent judiciary and press, strong and assertive political oppositions, and a vigilant civil society. However, we have reached a place in the journey of the Indian Republic after seven and a half decades, when democracy and democratic freedoms have never been as hollowed out and freedoms as threatened as they are today. VDEM Institute uh, rings alarm bells by categorizing India as an electoral autocracy. We should look at some of the most dramatic and worrying of these signs of collapsing democracy in India. The first, uh, the most visible is probably the crushing of dissent in politics, in civil society, and in academia. Freedom House in its 2020 report decries the deterioration of basic freedoms in India. Just some examples. The use of the anti-terror uh, law, the UAPA against dissenting voices, intellectuals and activists of impeccable integrity, both seniors and young activists for years without trial or bail. Uh, I could give you many examples, but let me talk about Father Stan Swami, uh, a Jesuit priest, um, one of the bravest people I've met. Uh, I met him some months before he was finally put into prison. He, uh, has de had devoted his life to uh, the rights of uh, indigenous people in, in the state of Jharkhand, living in a small room. And uh, he was charged with, uh, with Maoist violence um, and uh, very far from the kind of um, politics and ethics that he stood for. Um, he, uh, he, he was clearly being targeted because he was uh, opposed to uh, the displacement of um, Adivasi people uh, and, their, uh, and their jailing in, in thousands uh, for uh, the establishment of this large super thermal power project uh, by Adani, who has now become India's uh, richest and the world's fifth richest person. Uh, but why I wanted to talk about him was that A, he was completely unafraid and unbent uh, when he was taken to prison. It just didn't make sense. He had Parkinson's. Uh, if they needed to interrogate him, he was available for, uh, 
for interrogation. There was no reason to put him into prison, but they insisted. Uh, once he was in prison, they were not even willing here because he had Parkinson's. He needed a, a, a glass and a sipper uh, to be able to drink water. Uh, the jailers refused to give it to him. The lower court refused, the high court refused. And they had to go up to the Supreme Court to get him a, a, a glass with a sipper. People from around the country uh, mailed <laughs> sippers to, to, to the jail, uh, but they, they didn't make it available to him. Um, his last letters uh, to the only family he had, which was his brother priests and to the young Adivasis, um, are beautiful to read and heartbreaking where he said, God, uh, had ensured that in, in these months of his life, he met these uh, impoverished persons in prison who, who, who actually took care of him because he couldn't even dress and undress and bathe alone. And like, their own, like his own sons, they took care of him uh, over those last months. Finally, he and COVID was at its peak uh, and it became clear that he was likely to die. And uh, in this last hearing of the court online, he came on and said, you know, just let me spend my last days uh, with the only family I have, uh, my brother priests and the Adivasi young people that was refused. And a couple of weeks later, he died. And I think India uh, and its democracy were, were diminished greatly uh, with that passing. But that is only one of many stories. This similar use of uh, the colonial era sedition law against political defend, defend, uh, dissenters. Uh, it's interesting that this was a colonial law which was used uh, famously also against Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, and he was charged for disaffection uh, against the state. And he said that affection is something that is earned and not forced. Uh, uh, many, many years ago. It's interesting that 97% of sedition cases filed after 2014 have been against citizens who criticize the government. There's the massive and brazen misuse of premier institutions of the state, the Central Bureau of Investigation, the Enforcement Directorate, the Economic Offenses Wing, Income Tax, authorities against a whole range of both political and civil society persons, uh, including myself, uh, uh, in order to try to silence them. Uh, there's very little debate in parliament. Most major decisions are now taken without any pretense of public consultation or consultation in, in parliament, whether it's demonetization of 86% of India's currency overnight, uh, the farm laws, the citizenship amendment law, the countrywide lo lockdown, and so on. We see other signs as well. We see the crackdown on funding for civil society, the foreign uh, uh, FCRA, which uh, is the licensing to receive funds. Uh, amendments to, to this make uh, compliance harder and harder. And uh, the power of the state to non-transparently, without giving reasons to deny, suspend, or cancel licenses is being used, uh, uh, again, to frighten NGOs into self-censorship. Um, 6,000 licenses of, of, uh, of NGOs were canceled uh, recently, and others stand on the anvil. Their pressures and even Indian funders, you know, you can't receive foreign funds. Indian funders are pressurized not to fund anti-government uh, NGOs. Um, environmental anti-displacement labor rights NGOs are treated as anti-development, therefore anti-national. Um, there's also the rapid, willful destruction of the liberal arts university. Uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University is, 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 is a prime example, but it isn't alone. Uh, there's a shrill popular discourse from, led from the top that equates the supreme leader, the ruling party, uh, the government, uh, the majority religion, and the nation, all as one. So any criticism of the supreme leader is against the nation. 
Uh, and then media reporting, uh, the World Press Freedom Index 2021, published by Reporters Without Borders, ranks India as 142 out of 180 countries, uh, describes it bad for journalism and one of the most dangerous countries for journalists trying to do their job properly. Uh, I, I, let me quote from the report, uh, journalists are exposed to every kind of attack, including police violence against reporters, ambushes by political activists and reprisals instigated by criminal groups. The coordinated hate campaigns waged on social networks against journalists who dare to speak or write about subjects that annoy Hindu to followers are terrifying and include calls for the journalists concerned to be murdered and the campaigns are particularly violent when the targets are women, uh, where, where the attacks are sexualized, uh, very intimidating. And we have examples uh, like Gauri Lankesh where, uh, where they've actually been murdered. Uh, journalists who dare to criticize the government are branded as anti-state, anti-national, or even pro-terrorist. Now, once again, uh, one story uh, will perhaps illustrate this. This is... Uh, uh, Siddi Kappan uh, uh, of Muslim Identity, a journalist who simply was coming from Kerala to report on the gang rape and murder of a teenage Dalit girl in Uttar Pradesh. And uh, he was uh, arrested in October 2020. He remains still in prison, charged with uh, a terrorist conspiracy uh, linked to the ISIS uh, even when he was, uh, he got COVID, he was very sick. Uh, his hands were tied to the hospital bed, a chain to the hospital bed, and he remains in prison. Um, Kashmir, of course, falls into yet another category. Political leaders, including uh, almost all the former chief ministers, were kept under arrest for months, year, longer. Uh, Kashmir also saw a seventh month the uh, internet shut down the longest in any democratic country. But, you know, in, in this first picture that I'm trying to portray of the crushing of dissent, I want to end with the story of bulldozer justice. Uh, uh, for many reasons, it's something that is unfolding today and something that uh, the prime minister of this country seemed to celebrate uh, uh, quite recently. Uh, what we're seeing is, is actually, uh, what is happening is, uh, is that uh, typically a, a, a bunch of uh, uh, Hindutva goons go and gather outside a mosque and start raising uh, the most uh, insulting slogans, uh, including, and I'm sorry, uh, if there are women around, but um, like Muslims are motherfuckers and you're shouting that and you're shouting that outside mosques uh, as a celebration of uh, Ram's uh, birthday, for instance. Uh, and, and then at some point, uh, somebody gets provoked, which they shouldn't. Somebody throws a stone and that's precisely what you're waiting for. A skirmish breaks out. There's some violence. And uh, the next day or the day after that, uh, the government decides to bulldoze the homes of people that it has decided were responsible for the violence, all Muslim. Uh, and firstly, there's nothing in the law that allows you to demolish people's homes because they committed any crime, including rioting. Secondly, you have to have some sort of process by which you establish people's crime. None of that is done. There's no pretense of doing that. And, and, and bulldozers come and they... Uh, break down their homes, uh, their shops. Uh, and uh, uh, the day this was happening in, in actually a, a Muslim settlement in, uh, in, in a slum in Delhi, uh, Boris Johnson chose to uh, go to inaugurate uh, a factory which produces the same bulldozers. And he was posed with sitting on that bulldozer himself. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then we had uh, uh, we had journalists. We have this journalist who actually jumped on top of a bulldozer and reporting live on top of the bulldozer as uh, as the uh, bulldozing was going on. And now it's become like a cult. 
uh, I haven't been in India for, for, for a bit and I'm planning to return, but I was just talking to friends and they were saying now it's become fashionable to wear caps with bulldozers, t-shirts with bulldozers, uh, you know, just celebrating uh, this way, you know, even the pretense of constitutional justice of rule of law it is, is, you know, I think it's crossed yet another line, uh, this bulldozer justice, because they, you know, nothing, I mean, the state is wreaking violent revenge, destroying the homes of, of people of one community with no pretense of any constitutional process at all, and do what you like. And sadly, till I speak today, uh, the higher courts have not stayed this process. So this is one story. Uh, the second you know, illustration of what is happening to India's democracy is the targeting of its religious minorities, especially Muslims, but also Christians, their freedom to worship, but even more importantly, their rights of equal citizenship. Um, I've spent the last few months uh, in Germany trying to study uh, what happened in Germany in the 1930s, um, uh, leading up to the Shoah, the, the Holocaust, and uh, also what German society has done since to rebuild itself into a humane society. What has been terrifying uh, in, you know, now that I've seen it so closely is how close, step by step by step, um, what happened in Nazi Germany in the 1930s with the Jews and what is happening in India today. I sat down and listed points of similarity and reached 23. And it cannot be just a coincidence. I mean, it, you know, it, it's obviously a playbook that you're following uh, right up to even having a particular film like Kashmir Files, uh, an anti-Jewish film, which was encouraged by Hitler himself and shown to the army and so on. I mean, there, there, there is step by step by step a similarity. Um, the Nazi history of Germany in the 30s must always remain a reminder to us that democracy is not just the rule of the majority, because that can mutate into fascism. We have to recognize that democracy is at least equally the protection of every minority, of all their freedoms, and ultimately their freedom to be themselves and yet be equal citizens in every way. In Modi's eight years, we have witnessed to the state openly now at war with its Muslim citizens, more covertly with its Christian citizens' freedom of worship. India today is wrenched by the tumult of a state-led cam state campaign of open hate directed against its minorities. I feel a kind of sickness that has set into the soul of our people. Vicious hate speech, lynching, attacks on livelihoods and cultural practices of minorities have become a normal, routine part of public life. So much so that uh, Gregory San Stanton, founder of Genocide Watch, predicted that India under Modi shows early signs of an impending genocide. The US Holocaust Museum estimates went much further. It estimates that after Pakistan, India is the country most likely in the world uh, to see a genocide. Yet the world doesn't seem to worry or to notice. I agonize to witness so many similarities, as I said, between what is unfolding in India today and uh, the hate campaigns against Jews against the 1930s. Just let me list only a few, runaway hate speech by senior political leaders in the media, in popular culture, and by ordinary citizens. These serve to manufacture popular hatred and legitimize this hatred and bigotry. Uh, NDTV does a tracking of what it called VIP hate speech, hate speech by senior leaders, uh, led by ably by the prime minister, the home minister, chief ministers, union ministers, etc. It found, found a 1,130% rise in VIP hate speech. Um, and, uh, and the most recent case of the uh, national, uh, the national spokesperson of the BJP, uh, 
uh, insulting uh, the Prophet uh, Muhammad. Uh, and uh, of course, nothing happened to her. She, she continues to represent the BJP night after night. It was only when uh, a group of 15 Mus Muslim majority countries protested and that for the first time there was some response. And it was declared that she's a fringe element. I mean, she's the national representative of the BJP. Um, and she's followed by the prime minister on Twitter. So are most of the people who, who are the most hateful in their, uh, in, in their uh, hate speeches are followed by the prime minister. Even more violent and hateful uh, are other people, you know, including those in uh, tech and you know, high tech and, uh, and corporate senior positions, uh, rarely punished. Uh, if arrested, they get bailed quickly. Uh, we saw something called the Dharam Sansad, uh, 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 which made open calls for, for genocide, uh, mass killings of Muslims and mass rape. Um, uh, reminder once again from Nazi Germany, uh, something that I think is really important to remember when we say the Holocaust didn't begin in the gas chambers, it began with hate speech. Um, hate speech led uh, by Adolf Hitler himself. I mean, I've been reading some of his writing about the Jews and uh, yeah, there's so much in similarity. If you look at uh, Mr. Modi's speeches through and the years that he was uh, chief minister of Gujarat. Mm. Then, uh, mm, Secondly, there is targeted hate violence against minorities by citizen vigilante groups and individuals, and the permissive role of uh, enforcement agencies and the courts. There's something that I see as an epidemic of lynching, which broke out uh, across the country in the name of the cow, protection of the cow, in the name of love jihad, and so on. Uh, we sought to make a response with uh, what uh, we call the Karwane Mohabbat. If we have time at the end, I'll, I'll show you a short clip about the karma. But basically what we resolved was that uh, I made a call for a group of citizens to, uh, we made a promise that we would go to every home of any person who has suffered lynching. And we would go not as a human rights worker or as a reporter, but like you would go to your family uh, or to a friend uh, and to do four things, to say, we want you to know that you're not alone, uh, that there are people who share in your pain and to, 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 to cry together. Uh, secondly, to say we seek forgiveness for what we have become as a people. Uh, thirdly, to say that we will be, we pledge to be with you. Um, in, 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 in the months and years that lie ahead as you pick up the pieces of your life again, as you fight for justice. And we will tell your story. We will not allow the story to be forgotten. And we tried to do, do this. It became, you know, we started with one German journey and we found it meant so much that we made about 30 such journeys to far corners of the country every month until uh, COVID happened. And uh, there's been an interruption and I, I'm longing to go back, whatever happens to me, and to restart our karma. And uh, it's a promise to myself that the first caravan that we will take after my return is to every home, and the family of every home that was demolished. Uh, and the second journey would be uh, to every person who is Family, who is in prison for speaking out in defense of our constitution. Um, then we've seen the altering of India's citizenship laws. Uh, and I think many of you are familiar with this, but um, the whole idea of, of, of India through its freedom struggle was that we would be a humane and inclusive country. It would not matter which God you worship, or if you worship no God, uh, what your caste, what your religion, what your language, what your uh, mm, 
identity, gender, you would be class, you would be an equal citizen in every way um, uh, with equal rights to be yourself. And it is this that, uh, uh, that the Hindu, Hindu right always opposed. Uh, they were opposed to our constitution. They were opposed to the freedom struggle. Uh, and they believe that India is a Hindu nation and we, the majority, will allow you, Muslims and Christians, to live here, if we wish, but as second-class citizens. And uh, the passage of a law in 2019, which basically said every Indian will first have to produce documents, vintage documents, uh, that can go back uh, 70, 80 years to prove that you're an Indian citizen. I would not be able to produce documents uh, which showed that my each of my grandparents and their siblings, I don't even know the names of all their siblings, but uh, and all the documents with regard to that. So you have to produce these documents, but if you cannot produce these documents and you belong to any other religious identity, except Muslim, don't worry. We will presume that you are a uh, 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 and a persecuted minority from some neighboring country. But if you're Muslim, we won't have that presumption. And so the first time actually uh, uh, religion became the basis of, uh, of the right to citizenship and it, it meant the end of, uh, of the idea of, of, of a humane inclusive country uh, for all people of all faiths. Um, then legal and social barriers to interfaith, uh, romantic and sexual relations and marriages uh, and the bogey of love jihad, which again is a, such an extraordinary idea that good looking Muslim boys are picked up in madrasas and trained to attract Hindu girls who obviously have nothing in their heads and, and so on. And then they're equipped to do this for which they have nice motorcycles and wires coming out of their ears or whatever. And you know, it's, it's such an absurd idea at one level, but you're killing people uh, for that idea. Um, all of this, I mean, I, I am not going into it, but each of these, you look at the Nuremberg laws you know, on citizenship, on uh, interfaith relations, etc. The targeting of cultural and religious practices of targeted minorities using both the law and with violent vigilant action, vigilante actions. Attacks on Christian shrines, priests, and nuns, which is massive uh, across many states. Uh, Tamil Nadu has been good for Hindu Muslim uh, in terms of Hindu Muslim uh, violence, but probably the largest number of uh, attacks on Christians and places of worship has actually happened in Tamil Nadu. Uh, mosques, where you're, 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 you're saying that mosques uh, were built. Uh, uh, at sites in which temples existed in medieval times, and therefore we have to avenge this by breaking down the mosques and building temples in their place. It's a hugely problematic idea in multiple ways, but uh, to me, there's also the question, you know, if you want to, if you feel that this kind of correction, retrospective correction of uh, harms of, uh, and violence of history, then, uh, then, how far back should we go? Why should we stop there? Because India actually after Ashok became a fully, almost fully Buddhist nation uh, and Buddhism was wiped out with great violence and uh, Brahminical Hinduism was restored. So maybe we should break down all temples and build Buddhist stupas there. But actually before that there were indigenous populations and their forms of worship. So let's break down the Buddhist stupas and restore Indigenous forms of worship, etc. So, how you know where is this uh, taking us? Uh, likewise, the rewriting of history in ways that demonize targeted minorities uh, and valorize the role of dominant groups. So, there's a history in which Muslims are evil people. Everything that they did was evil, uh, and and so on. I mean, when the British came. Uh, to India, uh, to conquer India. India was seen as one of the richest uh, and most industrialized uh, countries in the world. This was under um, uh, Mughal 
uh, Mughal rulers. So, but no, that's a completely dark time of history. And in a strange way, this is also the colonial uh, sort of uh, uh, story of, because the colonial story is that there was this golden ancient period of Hindu uh, India, then there was the very dark medieval period of Muslim India. And then the British came in and uh, brought us civilization uh, in, in amidst that darkness. And in a strange way, uh, that is sort of coming back to us. Uh, renaming cities and roads. Uh, again, anything that has, you know, there was suddenly a campaign that uh, 40 roads in, uh, and, and locations in, in Delhi need to be renamed because something has Muhammad and something has Sarai and, and so on. Um, rewriting school textbooks, uh, again, to exclude and demonize minorities. Um, and not just this, I mean, even, even the Holocaust incidentally is described in, you know, is not described. Hitler is described as a great nationalist leader in, uh, in the Gujarat textbooks. Um, then the targeting of the economic base of minorities, their livelihoods and properties using both changes in law and violent vigilante actions. And there's a whole range of actions that attack uh, the livelihoods of uh, and break the back of their, uh, you know, to, uh, um, then forcing separate living and get ghettoization and so on. I could go on. Um, you can see terrifying echoes, not just of Nazi Germany in the 1930s, but also of Jim Crow's America and the genocide of the Rohingya in Myanmar. The third um, is not so obvious, but I think it's really important to talk about when I talk about uh, the crises of India's democracy, and that is crony capitalism and the abandonment of the state's responsibility to the working poor. We see the hubris of highly centralized opaque decision-making that in effect abandons the poor and is worryingly crony capitalist. Uh, the pandemic is, of course, a dramatic example which lays bare with ruthless moral clarity the, uh, the catastrophic public costs of inequality. Thousands, even millions of lives could have been saved uh, if we had made much greater investments in public health provisioning, in labor rights. But, you know, when the Prime Minister announced with four hours notice on television, uh, 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 you know, uh, a nationwide lockdown. I was just, I just couldn't believe, I mean, despite everything I couldn't believe, he was saying, everybody stay at home. Okay, I have to have a home. What about if I don't? Everybody keeps social distance. 60% of Indians live in one room or less. How will I keep social distance? Work from home. Nine out of 10 workers in India are informal workers who have no social security, who eat what they, you didn't think about them. Wash your hands regularly. I, I have, you know, running water, if you go to any slum, you'll see people gathering around the tank. They spend about a quarter of their earnings uh, on a good day uh, to buy this pot of water. You're asking them to wash their hands regularly. So, so you, you, you didn't even imagine or think about the poor uh, when, when, uh, when this happened. There was an explosion of mass hunger, joblessness, mass dislocation of millions of work, working poor people. Um, 120 million jobs were lost in just 2021. 92 million of these were in the informal sector. 84% Indians suffered a significant fall of income. Uh, many fell into deep and stubborn uh, poverty. But, but what is extraordinary, uh, and I'd like to underline this, is that for India's super rich, the pandemic became a time to swell their wealth dizzyingly. Uh, the net worth of Mukesh Ambani, who was then India's richest man, doubled to $85.5 billion in 2021, the year that we had you know, people dying on the streets, uh, funeral pyres. It rocketed him for that period into from India's to Asia's richest man before Adani overtook him. I was looking at data that Mukesh Ambani added 900 million rupees to his wealth every hour from the time that the 
pandemic was uh, the lockdown was uh, was announced every hour but Gautam Adani, of course, is, is somewhere else. Uh, his wealth in 2021 multiplied 10 times from 8.9 billion uh, in 2020 to 89 billion in February 2022. He raced past Ambani, became Asia's richest man and the world's fifth richest man. The proximity of these two billionaires to the present ruling establishment is not secret. But the surge in the wealth and the numbers of dollar billionaires in India extended well beyond them. In the worst pandemic year of 2021, the number of dollar billionaires in India expanded by 39%. India today is home to the largest number of dollar billionaires after the US and China, more billionaires than France, Sweden and Switzerland combined. Um, and in, in all of this, I, I took a petition to the Supreme Court saying, you know, you, uh, those of us who are in the formal sector are getting the equivalent of our wages. Uh, it is only just that uh, informal workers should get the equivalent of minimum wages. Um, of course, it wasn't agreed to uh, with uh, Prabhat Patai, Jyoti Ghosh and I wrote a series of uh, op-eds on this. They calculated it would have cost just 3% of of GDP to do this. And of course, the impact on the economy would have been much less devastating uh, as well. But there's no, there's no place for this discourse. And I thought that there'd be one corrective after the pandemic, at least there would be some token improvement in public health provisioning or in labor rights protection, but actually the reverse has happened. And finally, I'll talk about the enfeeblement of most institutions of India's democracy. Um, the election commission, for instance, uh, the kinds of people who have been appointed are so openly partisan and weak. Um, but also, very interestingly, they changed the law to allow legally uh, anonymous donations to political parties, just reversing the idea of transparency. And surprise, surprise, the large majority of these huge amounts of funding have gone uh, to the ruling party. And we have no way of knowing legally who uh, has funded them. Um, the higher judiciary, uh, you know, through all of this, uh, was some, you know, we could turn to them for justice, but through all of this, the Central Amendment Act, uh, Kashmir, uh, human rights abuses, uh, all of these people being arrested without and detained for years without trial. None of this are we seeing uh, responses from the higher judiciary. There's the abject caving in of the civil services. I spoke about the media, but one thing that is important to compare with the emergency, in the emergency formally, uh, media freedoms were taken away, but there was a, they were chaffing for that freedom. Today we are seeing, nobody's formally taken away your freedom, uh, but you have the large majority of of, uh, of, uh, of the media now acting as, you know, as vocal cheerleaders of this majoritarian anti-Muslim. You know, if you look at most television channels every night, they seem to be just propagating uh, extreme hate. Nobody's, you know, obviously forcing you. So, so, so you're seeing a completely, when people compare to the emergency, that's, you know, the emergency was terrible but it was not a hate campaign. And, and, and that's what makes what is happening now even more terrifying. Uh, you know, the, the opposition has had a lot of problems, has, is somewhat intimidated in the silence, but the idea of this clueless opposition and uh, uh, Rahul Gandhi is this fool, I and mean, whatever he says is presented as, as if he's some kind of... Uh, clown, fool, etc., is all something that has again been manufactured by, and on social media, you know, do you expect me to vote for the village idiot? Uh, so somebody then responded, yes, I would vote for a village idiot over a mass murderer. But, you know, but, uh, but that's, that's where we become. Finally, where do we go from here? And I, I strongly believe that all is not lost. Uh, but around the world, uh, since this is not happening only in India, we're finding in country after country, more and more people are opting for rulers, uh, for leaders. Uh, France is, 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 is the 
nearest example. I mean, uh, a significant sec section of the electorate seem to be wanting leaders who promote hatred against minorities. Uh, and what do we do in, 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 in this time of challenge? Uh, and I believe that somewhere uh, we have to think about how do we build a humane society founded on the idea of in a radical new imagination uh, to imagine and build a social contract around fraternity and what I call radical love. The idea of the word, the idea of fraternity is problematic because it is brotherhood, it excludes sisterhood. But in India, actually, uh, the Hindi word for, our, for fraternity is a lovely one. It is bandhuta. And bandhuta is derived from Sanskrit, which is literally the idea that we are bound to and with each other. And, you know, in a sense, if you are in pain, I feel your pain. If Pehlu Khan is being lynched, you know, and being beaten on his back, I feel the pain on my back. To me, that is the idea of, 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 of Bandhuta. I think the closest bond that two human beings can have is what in Hindi I would call Dard Ka Rishta, a relationship of pain, where I feel your pain is mine. There are many sibling ideas of Bandhuta. Uh, let me speak of them, I empathy. But empathy, again, you know, I've learned is, uh, you know, the idea, it's not just the idea of that I feel your pain. I think there has, there has, it's, it's first an act of imagination and then an act of feeling. We're living in a world where, I, and with homeless people, I see it very dramatically because we see homeless people every day. If you live in any city, except during the lockdown, maybe, there isn't a day when you won't see homeless people. But we know so little about them and we care even less. I remember the first time uh, uh, when we opened the first shelters for homeless women, I sat with them and said, what has changed most in your lives? And uh, a woman stood up and said, for the first time after 20 years or something, I can sleep at night and be sure that no one is going to rape me until the morning. Now, as a man, I don't think I'll ever be able to imagine what life would look like to me in these circumstances. But even for a woman, uh, for, for, for the women sitting here, one act of sexual violence, uh, even harassment, and you have to struggle with it. Uh, sometimes for, for, for years, uh, for a lifetime, what would life look like to you if every night, night after night, you were exposed to sexual violence and there was nothing you could do about it. There was no police station where you could go and complain, where somebody would pay attention to it. There's no place of safety that you could go to tomorrow to ensure that it doesn't happen to you. And no NGO is going to come out, no civil society is going to come out with candlelight marches to protest. That is the act of imagination then the act of feeling. Um, so empathy, compassion. Again, I, I like the idea of what I would call egalitarian compassion. It's, it, there's one idea of compassion that you are here, I am here, and I'm giving you my compassion. I like to think of egalitarian compassion that we are actually standing together like this. And I recognize that you are suffering greatly at this moment and I'm reaching out to you because we are people of equal worth. But a day can come when I will be suffering and you can reach out to me. It's a, that's egalitarian in compassion for me. There's also the idea of caring. And here I'd like to quote uh, Noam Chomsky where he was talking about social protection. He said, social protection, what is social protection? Social protection is ultimately the idea and please hear this carefully. Uh, it's again something I love a lot. What is social protection? It's the idea that we should take care of each other. Some of the most profound ideas in the world, I think, are, are the most simple. Can we build a society where we take care of each other? Um, 
And Bandhuta sort of gives us clues about how to resolve all of these crises, that laws of inequality, imagining a new social order where we take care of each other. Um, some, some, you know, we have many hugely problematic aspects to our civilizational history in India, uh, inequality of caste and gender. But there are a few things that I think we must reclaim and offer to the world, actually. The first is the idea of equal belonging without conditionalities. So I'm living in Germany, and there's much that I admire. But the idea that if you want to belong to Germany, you must learn the German language. You must learn our culture. It's our country. You have to, you have to qualify to be part of this. But can we imagine a country where it belongs to all of us? And, uh, and the, you, know, you can be yourself, you can dress, eat, speak the language, uh, love, uh, whatever in the way that you choose. And all that is binding on us is a set of constitutional values. So in Germany, when I say, is Islam part of German culture, people fall off their chair. But actually, 20 to 25% of Germany is now immigrant populations. Much of them are Turkish people. And why is there not, I mean, that, why should the Turkish people only have to learn from us? Why can't we sit together and say, wow, you know, they're beautiful things that you are bringing in, they're good things that we can bring in, and can we, this is our country together. That idea of equal belonging without conditionalities is, is one idea. The second is, is an idea of secularism, not as the denial of religious faith, but actually equal respect for every faith, including the absence of faith. And here, I think the Abrahamic religions will have to have some rethinking. Uh, and, you know, I mean, this idea that ours is the only path if you believe that, then where is the space for equal respect? And I think, again, in, in the civilizational uh, experience of, of India, one of the finest things we have is the notion of doubt. I'm not sure. Um, and doubt, skepticism, Amartya Sen has written a lot about this in, in the argumentative Indian. Uh, to give an example, uh, the Rig Veda is this beautiful, uh, you know, in, in, poetry which describes the creation of the universe. It's like the book of Genesis. You have this beautiful description of how the universe is created. What is the last, last verse? After you've done this description, it is, but who knows whether the world was actually created this way? I don't know. You don't know. Only God knows. Maybe he also doesn't know. Full stop. Finished. I think, I think that's a clue. That's a clue into how we can, so I've chosen my path, but actually yours is, might be equally good. Uh, so, so that idea. And thirdly, that hatred cannot be fought with hatred. If there's darkness and I want to fight darkness in this room and I fight it by making everything else dark, I'm only going to deepen darkness. Uh, somehow, even if there's a tempest, uh, you know, can I light a candle? Likewise, how do, I, how do I fight hate? Why do I, how do I find a new idiom of resistance? And if you could do the film, I just thought uh, it will just give you an illustration from the Karwane Mohabbat. And then I'll just end with one last idea of radical love. If I'm not even looking at Yen. You're fine. You're fine. Okay. okay. <laughs> Please. मुझे लगता है कि कायर तो वो है जो हाथ उठाता है कमजोर पर लोगों के दिलों में डर पैदा करता है असली साहस तो वो है जो इस जो इस सब के बीच में नफरत का सामना करता है एक चोट है जो हम हमारे अपनी ह्यूमैनिटी पर लग रही है हम 
हमारे अपने जमीर पर लग रही है हमारी अपनी इंसानियत पर लग रही है सारे हिंदुस्तानियों की एक किस्म की सेंसिटिविटी भी नम हो गई है अब हमारे लिए एक लिंचिंग का जो खबर आती है कहीं चौथे पांचवें पेज पे उसको हम इसी तरह से पढ़ जाते हैं इन यात्राओं में अब हम लोग डेढ़ साल से जा रहे हैं लोगों के घर जो चेहरे नहीं भूलते ज़्यादातर वो उन बूढ़े माँ बाप के हैं जिन्होंने जवान बेटे खोए हैं वो ये कंप्लेन नहीं करते कि मेरे बेटे को क्यों मारा वो इस स्टेज पर आ चुके हैं कि वो कहते हैं अरे गोली मार देते तलवार से मार देते इतना टॉर्चर करके क्यों मारा किसी को भीड़ द्वारा ये पीटा नहीं जा रहा है क्योंकि उन्होंने कुछ किया इसलिए उनको भीड़ द्वारा पीटा जा रहा है क्योंकि वो कुछ हैं हमने देखा है कि लोग किस तरह से उन्हें सिर्फ मारा ही नहीं गया डराया गया है तो एक खौफ का पूरा जो माहौल है एक खौफ का दौर जो पूरा पैदा कर दिया गया है वो भी इस नफरत के साथ साथ पूरा हुआ है थ्रेटनिंग वॉइस में कहा जाता है और मारते हुए कहा जाता है कि भारत माता की जय बोलो वंदे मातरम बोलो प्रूफ करो कि तुम पाकिस्तान पाकिस्तानी नहीं हो या पाकिस्तान को सपोर्ट नहीं करते हो तुम सबूत दो कि तुम इस देश को चाहते हो उन्हें नहीं कहने की जरूरत पड़नी चाहिए हमारे आगे पर वो कहते हैं हम बाय चांस नहीं हम बाय चॉइस इस कंट्री में रुके थे हम इस मुल्क को बहुत प्यार करते हैं हम तो ये भी करते हैं हम वो भी करते हैं पैर पैर पर उन्हें अपनी राष्ट्रवादी होने का सबूत उनसे मांगा जा रहा है शायद वक्त ये आ गया है कि इस देश की जो मेजोरिटी कम्युनिटी है हम लोग जिनका जिनको ये कॉन्फिडेंस है कि हम विक्टिमाइज नहीं होने वाले हैं मुझे कोई मेरे घर से खींच के नहीं निकालेगा और कहेगा कि भारत माता की जय कहो तो हम लोग किस कि, किस देश में रहते हैं किस देश में रहना चाहते हैं हमने किस कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन को इनहेरिट किया है उसकी तरफ हमारी क्या रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी है कि हम लोग जानते हुए कैसे अनजान बन सकते हैं ये अब हमारे लिए मुमकिन नहीं होना चाहिए तो इतना तो हमने तय किया कि हम अपने देशवासियों को ये बचाओ उनके खामोशी को के लिए देने के लिए तैयार नहीं हमने तो बताया और हम बताते रहे और हम बताते रहेंगे हम लिखेंगे हम बोलेंगे हम फिल्म बनाएंगे हम हर तरह से बोलते रहेंगे जब तक कि आपका जमीन तक हम पहुंच नहीं पाए तब तक हमारा काम बोलने का खत्म नहीं होगा तो ना सिर्फ हम आपके दुख में शामिल हैं बल्कि हम माफी भी मांगना चाहते हैं कि हमारा देश इस हालत में पहुंचा है जिस हालत में नफरत इतनी फैल गई है कि आपके परिवारजनों को इस तरह से मारा जाना पड़ा um when i'm speaking about a new idiom of resistance uh which is uh founded on great courage but also on love um and you know many people sort of think this is like a okay but it's a very idealistic idea where does it really happen and i thought i'd end with a few examples Uh, from recent times and in slightly older times um there's a tech city just next to uh, delhi uh, gurgaon where this uh, you know and it grew very very fast uh, and it's the highest tech uh, high, highest per capita income uh, city in the country now and uh, because it expanded so fast they just two mosques and a large number of the workers who came in were muslim they needed a place to pray on fridays so they were praying at about 108 locations suddenly there became a campaign we don't want them to pray so 
so it came down and then they negotiated, negotiated and came down to 30. And I told them this was about two, three years ago that, you know, this is not something that you should give in to. But people felt we have to have fine peace. So they agreed to bring it down to about 30, 30. Now, suddenly it became another new that, no, we don't even want them in these 30 places. And it's, it's strange, just like these caps with bulldozers, you suddenly have people who just decide at you know 12 o'clock, at one o'clock on Fridays, they suddenly want to, you have this group of young men, young boys who say, we want to play cricket just at one o'clock on Friday afternoon on that ground where you'll pray. Or somebody else does, uh, you know, the Sunnis have Hindu prayers at that very site, etc. So, but in the middle of this, we suddenly had a call from the Sikh Gurdwaras saying, you need a place to pray. What's the problem? Come and pray in the Sikh temples. And then you had many young, many people saying, I have a factory, come and pray here. Um, I have a, a terrace in my house, come and pray here. Uh, the, it might seem like a small thing, but to me, it was very significant. As long as we have enough people who come out um, in, uh, you know, in the Citizenship Amendment Act uh, happened, I had feared that there would be, again, this silence, this silent acceptance. And I wrote out a tweet uh, and, a, and an op-ed saying that I've learned from Mahatma Gandhi about the importance of civil disobedience, uh, which means that you must publicly disobey a law that you'd consider unjust. So I announced that if this law is passed and if I'm asked to produce documents, um, I, uh, you know, to prove my citizenship, I will refuse to produce the documents. But there's something else in civil disobedience uh, uh, another requirement is that you must demand punishment. Now, my problem was that I am not a Muslim. So the law is produced that even if I don't produce documents, actually I won't be punished. So then I thought about it and then I put out saying that if this happens, then at some point they'll ask you your religion, I will register as Muslim. And then I won't produce my documents. And then if my Muslim brothers and sisters are denied citizenship, I will demand that the same happens to me. Of course, um, the, the trolls have never stopped, uh, uh, you know, uh, forgotten this. So whenever I say anything, they want to ask about whether I've been circumcised yet and so on. But, but that aside, uh, I never said I would convert to Islam. I said I would register in official documents as Muslim and then refuse and then dem demand punishment. But what actually happened was a nationwide spontaneous uh, uh, response of the kind that we have not seen since independence, where Hindus came out in campuses across the country, uh, in, in places for about 100 days. I was almost every day addressing crowds of maybe 100,000 people, the constitution, uh, was the symbol of the protests, the national flag. It was really beautiful to watch. Uh, uh, you know, and it was also a display of Hindu-Muslim unity, uh, the greatest since Mahatma Gandhi's assassination. Um, and some of the slogans were lovely uh, in, in university. They were saying, you divide, we multiply, and, and so on. So that gave us hope. Germany never saw this incidentally. I mean, this is the one reason I can still hope um, in, in the hijab, when the hijab controversy happened, these girls, uh, and as we know, suddenly the boy students uh, got radicalized and uh, this, they wore these saffron uh, uh, scarves and wouldn't allow the girl in hijab to come into the school. And this happened and this young woman, young girl, of, young woman of 16, she walked in with, with in great difficulty through all of this. Somebody asked her, now will you register a police complaint against uh, the boys who, who hectored you in this way? She said, of course I will not. Uh, they after, after all, my fellow students, uh, they're like my brothers. I don't want harm to come to them. Um, Shaheen Bagh became pretty famous uh, because it was a place of resistance in, in the CA protests. Uh, many things happened there. Uh, let me tell you one story again. Uh, 
uh, this uh, chap who's a union minister and still a union minister raised slogans uh, ke ko goli maro ko, that these traitors of the nation shoot them down and uh, somebody then came a few days later and actually took out a gun at Shaheen Bagh. The women of Shaheen Bagh decided that we must give them a, a reply. And this was a reply that the working class women of Shaheen Bagh gave. And it was, uh, Desh ke sab ko, uh, oh, you beautiful people of my country, addressing the same people, pool barsao saaron ko, shower flowers on all of you. You might think it's insignificant. I think it's huge. I think this is the paradox of love that and the, the reply of love that, I, that I'm speaking about. Um, I learned, uh, you know, Gandhi's uh, last months. Um, let me tell you one story there and, um, and then I'll end with one. Yeah, one or two more stories. Yeah. Okay, so Gandhi, uh, when India was celebrating its independence, Gandhiji was not in Delhi, he was in Calcutta because people were killing each other, the slaughter was, Hindu-Muslim slaughter was unending. He went on this fast and said, I will not eat anything until the last violence ends. And a story is told, many stories are told, one of them is this Hindu man who comes in really furious and angry, saying, what you're doing is terrible, uh, he tells Gandhiji. And he says, I had a little boy this small, uh, and the Muslim mobs killed him. Um, how do you expect me to, to forgive and not to feel hate in my heart? And Gandhiji replies, I, f I understand your pain, but find a little boy this small. A Muslim boy whose parents have been killed by Hindu mobs, adopt that child as your own, raise him like your own son in his own faith, and maybe you'll find the spaces to heal. Um, I'll talk of one example from outside India. Uh, there's one prime minister whom I admire above all, and this is a woman called Jacinda Ardent uh, in New Zealand. Uh, for many reasons, but uh, you might recall that at Christchurch in 2019, there was uh, this young white boy man who went in and live streamed while he shot down 50 people in the mosque praying. How did she respond? Firstly, she said, I refuse to ever name him. He said, he is not us. The people he killed is us. And there was just 1% of New Zealand is Muslim and they're all these immigrants. She said, they are us. Um, she, she did exactly what we do in the karma. She went to the families and shared their pain. And in cultural respect, she also covered her head. The next Friday prayers uh, all across New Zealand, uh, uh, the azan was sounded on all television and radio channels. Women, Newsreaders, police women spontaneously covered their heads to show solidarity. People gathered outside the mosques and put their hands together and said, we will stand in protection, you pray. Uh, the Imam uh, of the mosque said at the end of it, he said, what has happened? We are broken hearted, but we are not broken. Uh, the people of New Zealand has showed us what love is. It's happened. It's happened just now. Um, and the very last story is something that also reminds me of Gandhiji's story. Um, a small town in, in, in Bengal, uh, Asansol, uh, we'd gone there in the karma. Uh, so typically this same provoking sort of happens. It was again Ram Navmi. And uh, finally, this uh, uh, violence broke out between the two communities. And a situation was reached, which was which is typically curfew was imposed. But by then, uh, two Muslim, uh, two uh, Hindu children, uh, boys were caught up in the Muslim area. And one 
Muslim boy was caught up in the Hindu area. So standard sort of hostage situation, you return, our boys will return. The Imam of that area said, this is completely wrong. Think of what the parents of these two Hindu boys would be going through. We must return them with no conditions in safety. And he did that. And then they waited for this boy, the Muslim boy. The Muslim boy was his own son. He didn't return. Uh, around midnight, he gets a call uh, from uh, the police authorities saying, we sorry, we found your boy and he's dead. He's been killed. And the Imam's spontaneous response is, don't tell anyone. I will announce it, otherwise the city will, will burn. The next morning when there's the prayers, people gather and he says at the end of the prayers, you notice my son is not with me. This is what has happened to my son. But the loss of my son is, is a huge tragedy in my life. But if you harm any Hindu in revenge, even by your, your thoughts, your tongue, or the actions of your hand, it will be a much greater tragedy for me. Um, when I went there, the boys, uh, the young men were crying and uh, I still feel a little emotional when I remember. And they said that we've grown up as little children, we've heard this Imam, when he said this, if he hadn't said this, we'd have gone out on a killing spree. Instead, we went out and formed you know, guard the Hindus who were in our area. We protected them. The city came into calmness. And, and I think it is, it, is, it is through actions of what I call radical love, love based on enormous courage, that we probably have an answer. I don't see any other uh, in the world that we are seeing where more and more of our leaders are pushing us into hatred and fear of people who are different from us. Can we respond to them with, with friendship, with curiosity, with respect, with love? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hans, for, for this, which is so much more than an academic talk. It is emotional, evocative, uh, as well as analytical. And, and, uh, and, and it's actually, I feel, it, it's, there's something in me that maybe would want to stop here, because <laughs> this, is, this is a very, very good ending. Uh, of this, but, but I think we, we should also take our duty as, as, as academics and activists serious and, and discuss the, the issues you, you, you put on the table here. Um, I, I have on purpose not uh, organized for organized a, a, a discussion for the talk because I, I thought that there would be enough people in the audience that would like to both raise questions and, and make points uh, so that instead of taking the time through a, 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 a proper discussion, I, I wanted to go on as quickly as possible to a question and an answer session. And of course, both the, the audience here can ask questions and there will also be people online. People online can type in questions and, and then uh, we will, we will uh, collate them at a certain point and, uh, and hear from them. So uh, also I, comments, I think. Yeah, yeah comments, questions. Uh, and, and of course, it is such a huge uh, field you have covered from, from your analysis of the, from fascistic tendencies, crony capitalism, uh, in, in, imperial, in, impairment of de democratic institutions and to where to go from here. There's so much in here. And I'm sure people will cover many different aspects, but I will simply hand over and I will have questions as well in case no one else will have. But I've seen, we'll start with, with Jairus.
And vice versa. <laughs> Thanks. We, we, we often try to, to take only one, one speaker at a time to, so we can get a proper answer and discussion going on the different questions. So I'll hand over to you. Yeah, um, and I need a long time to answer, but I, I mean, I uh, resonate a lot with everything that you asked. Um, I wrote a, you know, a, a book called Looking Away, uh, Inequality, Prejudice and Indifference in New India really asking, and I, I suggest that the Indian rich and middle classes are among the most uncaring uh, in the world today. And I've tried to understand why it is, and you know, what is the moral uh, landscape that makes us so uncaring. And uh, I suggest that it is 
a combination of this history of caste, the idea that the accident of your birth legitimately determines everything uh, in terms of your life possibilities, whether you live at all, what kind of life you'll have, what kind of education you'll have, uh, what kind of jobs are open to you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so that's one idea. Then we've combined it with the British idea of class, uh, which unfortunately, you know, the good families, persons with old wealth, and uh, you know, and, and and so on. I mean, even sometimes my, you know, somebody says this person comes from a good family, and I say, what do you exactly mean? They have a lot of character, or what? What are you really talking about? And then I think what was the tipping point was the new liberal light moral idea that greed is good. And I think the combination of caste, class, uh, prejudice, and neoliberalism has been lethal. And we are a particularly uncaring uh, uh, set of people. And it's demonstrated over and over again. I mean, like in the pandemic, uh, how did middle class people not, you know, when, when they were listening to the prime minister, why did people not react. And when 30 million people then ended up walking highways during the hot summer, hundreds of kilometers, most middle class people said, oh, you know, where have all these people come from? And I was asking them, just look at one day in your life, you know, uh, who is it that provides a newspaper at your house? Who provides the milk at your house? Who comes in and cleans your floors, who cooks the food so that you can go out to work, who looks after your children, who drives you to work, and so on. Our, our entire lives are dependent on workers whom we don't even see as human beings. Uh, I sometimes think it's almost like an Aladdin lamp. We wish we had an Aladdin lamp, uh, and you rub it, and these people should appear and serve you. And then you rub the Aladdin lamp, and they should disappear. Uh, we don't see them as human beings with legitimate needs, dreams, aspirations, etc. So I totally agree with you. Uh, but but the, still, the question is that during the freedom struggle, and you know, I couldn't speak more about Gandhi's uh, what I think is his finest moment. I, there are huge problems with Gandhi as well, especially his defense of caste. But I feel that we are very fortunate in the legacy that we have of those last months of the freedom struggle, where think of a million people who've killed each other in, in the Muslim riots. A new country has been constituted uh, on, on the basis of, of religion. Rivers of blood are flowing. My own family was one among those who were displaced from what is now in Pakistan in really bloody circumstances and so on. It was very easy to say at that point of time that you know this country has been constituted on the basis of Muslims have their country, this is Hindu, India. That it didn't happen was to me the ultimate example of radical love. And he knew that it would, you know, it would cost him his life. He was ready to do it. So, but again, the important thing is not Gandhi as much as it is not Hitler in Germany. It is that the large majority of Indians supported him. So we are a society quite paradoxically, which, which, which could love and adore Gandhi. His last fast, actually, just two weeks before he died, is, is perhaps the most extraordinary. Uh, when uh, you know the refugees had come in tens of thousands into Delhi, there was so much anger. And they were forcefully converting mosques into yeah, in the Darga, etc., by putting idols in there. And he said, you know, it cannot be a place of worship a true place of worship, which is based on des desecration of other uh, religions. His demand was that it must be, we must return with respect uh, the Nmeroli Darga and we cannot place mosque, etc., etc. He, he, he demanded, Irfan Habib has written about this as a witness. He said that uh, the only way as a refugee which, who came from Pakistan was to get a house was that by driving out Muslims. People were driving out Muslims. He was saying, go back to the Muslims you've driven out and tell them to come back to their homes. Don't go to Pakistan. This is your country. Which means you then go back to a refugee camp. And to even make this demand was extraordinary. And 
but the important thing is that uh, and this was one time when even Nehru and everybody advised him this is not the time to make this demand he said I will make these demands uh, the first day 10,000 people came out in his support by the 50 or 100,000 people were on the streets supporting this demand so I think we have a complex uh, civilizational history I somehow sense that we have our best selves and our worst selves contained within us uh, the genius of Gandhi was to bring out our best selves. The genius of our present rulers, Mr. Modi in particular, is to bring out our worst selves. It's a little complex. I, I, I can't explain it. Uh, the, the second question uh, of, uh, and uh, the solidarity across, I mean, communalism as being the answer to caste inequality, I think is, is a profound uh, recognition. Uh, Political scientists had told us that it is impossible to get a majority in India on an openly anti-Muslim platform uh, in elections because there are a number of constituencies in which Muslims form a significant part of the population. The BJP under Modi said that we will prove you wrong. And the only way they could do it was to unite everybody across caste, but also across religion against the one common enemy, uh, which is the Muslims. In 2019, every third Dalit actually voted for BJP. The Christians uh, all across Northeast India actually voted BJP. So they have succeeded in, in the construction of this common enemy. And, and therefore, communalism is, is right. They don't give them equality. Instead, they give them somebody else to trample on. Uh, and why does Mr. Modi survive is, is I think, a huge question. Not only scams. Uh, the, you know, when the pandemic happened, we, we, each time you think this is now the tipping point, like what is happening now, Agni, but, but I really don't know when we'll reach that tipping point. Uh, when the pandemic happened, the suffering was so extreme. Uh, Time magazine actually carried a cover story where they followed this one uh, Hindu migrant and the amount of travails he, he, he suffered. At the end of it, they asked him, and who are you going to vote for in the next election? And he said, of course, Modi. So, uh, so then they end with an interview with me and he asked me, how do you explain this? And I said that, you know, something is happening. It's, you know, he, they're succeeding in injecting in the veins of our society, uh, a very, very powerful drug. The drug is called hate. And intoxicated by that drug, everything is acceptable. Hunger is acceptable. Joblessness is acceptable. Displacement is acceptable. It's, it's a terrifying situation. I mean, Nazi Germany, at least the economy was strengthened and revived. We are actually seeing the collapse of our economy. We're seeing the worst economic situation, the contraction of... Uh, and yet, his, uh, his support is only growing. The power of hate, I have no other explanation, really. Thank you. Um, please. Get the same kind of scenes that uh, the 
even the film in a way and and, and that this is the subject but what i want to ask is don't you feel that the the sort of resistance to the government excesses that you feel during the upa is missing right now no, it, and how yeah. can this be i mean how do we fight this fight because i, I really don't understand like Because you've been at the forefront of this struggle. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish I, I wish we we understood fully, but uh, but there's no doubt that I think it's a it's it, it's it's a battle of a generation. Uh, large, there's a huge radicalization of the of the Indian Hindu, and if we don't recognize it, uh, we're missing something. I mean, this if you have, I mean. seeing those nice bright faces of young teenage uh, boys coming and playing cricket uh, you know on friday afternoons at 1 o'clock it just sort of bit through me i mean i've seen you know don't they have something more constructive to do in their lives i mean they think they've sort of suddenly accomplished uh, so there's a certain radicalization that is unfolding of the hindu mind what the the discourse is is basically that the muslims uh, through the thousand years that that we had muslim rulers in india were tormentors and oppressors that we have not found anyone even after independence who had the courage to name this enemy within and then to fight them and for the first and that's why when somebody says we actually won freedom in 2014 not in 1947 this is what they're saying that this is the, you know uh, and it's not just that actress who said it this is sort of the popular sentiment uh, and and so it's a very it's a very difficult and you're making films about this this whole reconstruction of muslims as being uniformly evil and uh, and the enemies and and therefore we have this sort of 56 inch chest sort of masculine uh, leader of course he makes some mistakes uh, you know we are unemployed and we <laughs> we, we, we 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 going hungry and we, all all of that is all right but he he's fighting the big fight and and i think that it is this radicalization that it's it's a huge failure of left liberal politics in civil society that we are not able to counter this we've not fought this battle uh i've talked a lot to senior political leaders who keep talking to me you know uh after the 2014 elections uh senior po- congress politicians said to me you know we've learned our lesson what is the lesson we've done too much for secularism we've done too much for for muslims and we've done too much for the poor now we have to set this aside the only way we can remain in power in power is to talk about hindu rights uh, to talk about uh, hindus and to talk about the middle class and 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 the rich and you know i i said firstly i wish you had done too much for Uh, for 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 the minorities for the poor and uh, for upholding secularism you wouldn't have been in this situation if you had secondly there are moments in in a country's journey in uh, when there's something more important than winning the next election even if that was how you'd win it uh, but but nobody is fighting that battle uh, not even the left not even the communist left and you know uh, and i have respect for them but uh this confronting this battle up front uh the capital m word sometimes which i which is muslim uh is you don't even hear it in in the so called uh, you know secular parties you know lynching may be happening who's talking about we'll talk about unemployment we'll talk about farmers but we'll not talk about muslims because we we'll lose votes and so on so i think that there is a A, a collective abandonment of the fundamentals of our constitution across uh, left liberal centrist politics also that is not unique to india i mean you look at the labor party in this country you look at the democrats you look everywhere uh, and and they've moved further and further to the right 
I mean, I was hearing uh, uh, Macron uh, in, in, in his debate with uh, Marine Le Pen. And it was interesting, he was talking and he said, we will take a stand against Islamic fundament, uh, racism. He was talking to Le Pen. I mean, why was he talking only about Islamic uh, you know, racism? Why wasn't he talking about white racism? Uh, and, and so on. So we all, we all sort of, the right wing has succeeded in, 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 in making us defensive about standing up for what is most fundamental in our belief systems. And I think that we all collectively bear responsibility for, for where we've come. My generation has let you all down, all you young people. You have to, you have to decide what kind of country and world you want to build. Jens and I are not good people to lead you in that journey. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, um, but at least I can try and lead this session. Uh, <laughs> we, we will go on till seven o'clock, uh, five to seven, uh, and, uh, and then we will, we will have to uh, decamp to the staff common room and continue the discussion there for those that would like to do so. Make some closing remarks. Uh, but we still have, we still have a, a bit of time left. Um, so, uh, should we take uh, the next question, Alpa? No, Alba, great uh, comparison. You know, the one big difference that I see is that uh, Hitler did succeed in strengthening uh, the German economy through very exploitative ways. I mean, I, I, I never realized the extent to which forced labor uh, was central to the German economy during Nazi times. And there was a complicity of the, almost the entire German population. I mean, forced labor was happening every factory without exception. Industry was running through the war. Farms were running all on forced labor. Uh, even the bakery down your street was running on forced labor. Uh, so there was an economic model that they had constructed, which seemed to be working for, uh, and, and then, Okay, I met a young, uh, I've had numerous conversations. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just processing the last months. I've learned a lot through these conversations. Uh, just one of them, uh, this young man was telling me, you know, my grandmother, she was a simple woman. So she said it as it was. And uh, when we asked her, what was the best period in your life? She said, of course, the Nazi period. And you say, why? He said, oh, they sent away these, Jews and we got all their properties cheap and we, you know, and we had a good life. Um, so I don't think there's, you know, I think, I don't think there are lessons to be learned uh, from Nazi Germany in terms of how they, through even the war, uh, the economy was protected uh, and sustained in ways that uh, were extremely oppressive and exploitative. But I do feel very much that the idea of radical love uh, is, is deeply, okay, let me, uh, as briefly as I can, I think that 
three principal crises um, at the level of some simplification that seem to be confronting our world, three clusters of crises. One is the, cluster, the crisis of inequality of the economic model. Uh, the second is the crisis of climate uh, change, but also climate change with equity at its center, uh, which you know. And the third is the crisis of how do we live with increasing diversity uh, around our world. And I believe that the idea of solidarity is actually a key to each of these, to answers to each of these. And, and an economic model uh, and, and a new radical new imagination uh, of, of the social contract uh, to resolve each of these. And the economic model, I think, is, is there's some things that are very clear. Universal social rights, for instance, the idea that we must take care of each other. And it hits me in, in multiple ways. I was responsible for leading on the dra drafting of the Food Security Act uh, uh, in the last government. It was you know, giving 800 million people half their calorie re requirements almost free. Uh, there was uh, 120 million school children getting free meals, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, when, when the uh, law was being debated in parliament, I found there was no one from the political establishment willing to defend it, uh, including people in the Congress. No one believed in it because neoliberalism is, is, is completely part of uh, our general consensus. So I was in front of television cameras every night trying to defend and I couldn't quite figure out why everybody was angry, uh, and including the anchors, all the anchors, not the ones who are normally angry. Everybody was angry. I couldn't figure out what was it. And in one of the debates, a, a leading industrialist who's normally considered somewhat sober, et cetera, uh, she said, I'm really fed up. Uh, what's wrong with the fact that I've made lots of money? I worked hard to make my money. I've done nothing to harm the economy. Why should I be taxed to feed the poor? And it was a moment which, you know, you have a moment of, I suddenly understood what this rage was about. And I said, I'm sorry, the poor work much harder than you. They've done much less than you to harm the economy. But this central point is that in a good society, I didn't have this phrase that we must take care of each other. But I said, in a good society, people of wealth must be happy to share some of it so that people who are living lives that are, which are completely intolerable for no fault of theirs uh, ha have uh, a, a decent life. I think it is, you know, I can make an economic case for it and a very strong economic case for it, but I have a feeling that we must make a moral argument. What is the good society and what is a, an economic model to construct and to approach that good society? And, and therefore, let us, the next battle must be, we cannot go into the next pandemic without universal health care. I mean, let's, let's be, in India, after the doctors, a large part of our doctors with taxpayers' money have got educated and gone uh, to North America and Europe and everywhere else, England. Among the ones left, 80% of them work for corporate, private, corporate hospitals. 80% of our doctors, just 20%, I mean, what you were saying about uncaring, 20% are left to work in the public health systems. How are we going to deal with any, uh, you know, any future health crisis? So it, the middle class don't care because we've sort of, we thought we'll always, we realize at this moment, but still there's no correctives. I think the battle for universal social rights in a new economic model built on the notion that we, why should we do it? Because we must take care of each other. And I think that we have to fight this upfront. And you know, I can make very strong more um, economic arguments for a Food Security Act. How can you have a country where one third of the population is malnourished? And how, how can you do this, etc.? How can you? But I, I don't want to make any of those. I want to make the argument for a good society and an economic model that that answers that that imagination. Gandhiji said that when you are in confusion, uh, think of the poorest person that you ever met, the weakest, and think of what you're, whether what you're doing is going to make sense to improve that person's life. If we use that talisman, we just couldn't have gone in for neoliberalism at all. So I, 
I am just sticking my neck out and saying we must have a discussion about our economic model with the fundamentals of the idea of a good society. I don't see a, sh a shortcut to that. I mean, even to the former prime minister, we, uh, you know, since I was on the advisory council, we used to have discussions. And he was, he, he was deeply committed to markets and he felt that that was uh, the only way uh, and so on. And I said that, so can we just, let's agree, okay, if you have free markets, let's just agree that there should be a floor of human dignity below which we will not allow anyone to fall. No child should sleep hungry. No child should have to die because there isn't health care, et cetera, et cetera. No old person should have to work till their last day because they, they don't have, have, have a pension. All of this is eminently affordable. Let's do this and, and, and move ahead from here. Um, so I think there's a new, a radical new imagination that is called for. I was talking to Jens uh, just before this. I was saying that when the Berlin Wall fell, uh, it was seen as the most ambitious experiment in human history to build a just and equal society collapsed. It was interpreted that the ideas of equality and justice have been defeated. They haven't. And out of the rubble of the Berlin Wall, it is for young people now to pick up and, you know, pick up the bricks again and rebuild. But, uh, but in ways that ensure I mean, we tried to build the most just and humane society by means that were the most unjust, cruel, and so on. It was bound to fail. What is this new imagination? We cannot say that the only imagination is this. And neoliberalism is now reaching a point where everybody is slowly admitting that there are not going to be any jobs. Uh, most young people will not be able to look forward to jobs. So we will give everybody one sort of... Um, what, um, what's it called, cash handout. I, I, I feel frightened about imagining such a world because we don't work only so that we get some money home. We get work because it gives us dignity and social worth. We have to imagine a new society. Uh, and I think the fundamentals of this new economy has to be built on the idea of a, of a, of a good society. I'm sorry if that sounds strangely uh, dissonant, but yeah. I'm convinced that they, that solidarity has to form the foundation of, of the answers to all the three challenges. How do we deal with climate? How do we deal with inequality? And how do we deal with difference? Thank you. And of course, uh, we, we don't have a lot of time left now. So I think we should take the, the last uh, questions, comments, as well as the ones that are that are online, and then we'll see if there's time at all to answer any of them at all. Um, the first one is from you, yeah, no, uh, you in the white top there, yeah. Very good question. Yeah, and so, but yeah, why is the West looking away? Looking away? Yeah, and, and you right in the back, yeah, yes. Thank you. Alessandra? Yeah, thank you so much. It's been inspiring and uplifting. Uh, again, I'm picking up on the idea of the comparison of any quotation from Italian to, of course, the Italian leader. <laughs> I think that the fascist that you want to write is quite extraordinary. Although, I mean, the way in which the radical love that overhauls fascism, well, who would write books, right? I mean, in the Soviet Union, I don't think in that context, you would actually overcome. So, I guess my question is, which type of political reforms uh, we would uh, have to see in India uh, so beyond the sphere of the individual, like perhaps embracing this radical uh, uh, love in particular, we talk about the similarities uh, of fascism, which is the anti party politics, the anti politics, we don't like individuals. So, we can't see the divide the principle of agency in order to fix that. Not in times of war, but in times of peace, to deactivate uh, uh, the space for political radicalism to form a different form. 
The last question from, from the floor here, yeah. Please, yeah. Thanks. And then we have questions from the from the online audits, um, which we can see here, but we can maybe also read them aloud. Um, thank you very much for this talk. What have you uh, what you have described as happening in India? We're seeing uh, that being replicated all over the work, world. A culture of intolerance. Do you think poverty has a role to play in some instances, and how much responsibility should be placed on the leadership of such countries versus what we can do, what we can be doing on the ground to educate the citizenry, citizenry as you are doing, so that they are more resistant to such di 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 divisive messages. That is one. Other one is while you're pointing. Oh, there are lots. So I'm not sure I can read them them all out. Uh, 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 while you while you pointed out uh, uh, about abject cave cave in of the, of the civil servants, your description of the judiciary was more like an indifference to grave injustices committed by the administration in in, in wrongful arrests, bulldozing scams, etc., including the death of Stan Swami. Would it be wrong to say that the judiciary has also caved in, uh, though it's pretending not to? Uh, I'm an Indian student at SOAS, here at, uh, in the US. Here, uh, people uh, struggle against growing problems of oppression from capitalism, racism, exploitation, and alienation from each other. I want to believe that nonviolence violence has the power to transform these systemic problems. But it can be difficult to convince Americans of this, whose culture is often unfamiliar and skeptical of conquering with love. I also often find it difficult to practice nonviolence within myself. Do you have any encouragement for me to keep believing and working along the nonviolent path? And finally, uh, from Shaban Adnan, you noted that the emergent signs of genocide are becoming evident in India under the current regime. Vina Das has observed regarding common violence of the past that the feared other has to be demonized into the fearful other in order to make lynchings and, and murders justifiable. Do you think that India today is going through such, such a proce process that may eventually lead to the genocidal expulsion of certain religious slash linguistic minorities i.e. the non-citizens of non-citizens of Assam. And really, there is no time to answer them. But if you want to pick one or, two, one, one or two issues very briefly to respond to, please do so. What I'll try to do is to give a one-line kind of answer uh, to many of the questions. Why is the West looking away? Uh, I think quite clearly because India is seen as the alternative to China, uh, both in terms of the economy and in terms of uh, geopolitical security. And there's a very cynical uh, engagement with India and uh, the resolve to look away. Um, uh, a lot of questions about uh, ethics, uh, also why, uh, why has India you know, fallen, and you know, why has hatred spread, uh, uh, taken root in India and so on. Um, I wanted to say one or two important things. Edu the lack of education, I think, is absolutely not correct. Uh, I worked in, I'm privileged in my work to work with India's 
some of India's poorest people, much of my life. And I have found that the more educated people are in formal senses, the best institutions, etc., they're the ones with the highest levels of anti-Muslim sentiment, sexism, anti-caste sentiment. The greatest degree of uh, survival of our civilization, uh, what is best in our civilization, this respect for every faith I find in the least educated and, uh, and the working class people, you'll find, uh, you know, in a working class home, you will find a woman who will walk out of her house, she'll see a, a mosque and she'll bow her head, she sees a church, she'll bow her head, she'll see her, you won't see this happening elsewhere. So it isn't the lack of education, uh, surely. My guess, and because it's a global phenomenon, I think this is really important, it is probably a lot to do with uh, the failure of neoliberalism uh, to create jobs for the millions. I think young people today across the world have no future to look forward to. And unless we recognize that that is the central problem, and either you then fight against to change the economic model, uh, or you look for scapegoats. And, and we're being led to say, the problem is not the economic model, it's these people of color, it's, uh, these people who do namaz, these people like this, people like that, uh, etc. And I think that, uh, because it's also a global phenomenon, it could, it's not something peculiar to India. We're seeing the rise of right wing, because there is just no job creation, decent work creation, uh, that this model is providing. Now, I think finally they're willing to admit to it. And uh, if we don't confront this problem, how do you expect every second Indian today is below the age of 25, which should be a glorious period. But what, what do they look forward to? What are we offering them in terms of uh, life possibilities? And if I'm not going to be, you know, uh, swept away, uh, judiciary, I think, has collapsed, it has caved in. Uh, uh, I think we are in the verge of, you know, it cannot be, a, it may not, will not be a genocide like Germany has seen. But do imagine a situation where 200 million people in our country uh, are going to live more and more in a situation of, in, you know, uncertain, insecure uh, citizenship. Uh, it's going to create a situation, I think we, do, we can't even imagine, it'll be something closer to the Rohingya uh, situation than, uh, than Nazi Germany, but we are in, in, at the verge of, of a catastrophe. The um, uh, role of civil society again, uh, I, I think that the amount of attacks that they're doing on civil society is because uh, the right wing sees it as actually the last opposition. Uh, they've tamed the political opposition, they've tamed the judiciary, they've tamed, tamed the media. They're fearful of us. And, uh, and I don't know how long they'll remain fearful of us, but uh, we have a particularly important role in these times. Um, uh, the friend who asked about, about nonviolence, how do I convince uh, people about nonviolence? Uh, and so on. So let me sort of do something a little unusual. Uh, I mean, uh, we can draw from many ethical systems, but there's something actually that Prophet Muhammad said, which I thought I'd just leave you with. Um, he said, what is the duty of a, a good human being when they witness injustice? So he said, at the very least, respond from your heart. Means at least you feel you care. Uh, the better among us respond with our tongue, which means we speak out against the injustice. The best among us respond with our hands, which means we act against the injustice. My, my only expectation is at least let us respond from the heart. Be kind. If enough of us are kind, the world will change. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, uh, before we break up, uh, you 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 said Jens, then you say something as well. So I will I will not say anything really, but just to add to so to this 
it's very depressing picture and uh, and, and so i will i want to to say if if we're looking for lessons to learn from how to challenge the common sense of hatred of bjp how to organize which means to use that then maybe one should go where i in my advice to you for the presentation here uh, advised you not to go namely to the global understanding of uh, 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 authoritarian populism and the fight against that this against the world there there are countries where 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 there, there are more successes than elsewhere and maybe just as it does appear that uh, RSS and BJP have learned from elsewhere. Uh, it is uh, the, the, the Latin America. Yeah, US. that is exactly what, where one maybe should try and learn from as well, to 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 try and counter that in in establishing the ideas of the good society and valid new imaginations and so on. But but that is just a. Yes, yes. Indeed, Indeed, closer to home, there are also Indeed. points to raise. <laughs> From Ramakumar, a member of the planning board in Kerala. <laughs> um, with those words, I will, I will thank you once again and uh, thank everyone who had stayed way over over time for this but that, that of course is a testament for the for the very interesting uh, and uh, uh, evocative and, and and an extremely important discussion and, and presentation we've had here now as i as i just mentioned briefly before uh, you're all invited to join us in the staff common room in the main source building at the first floor it requires all sorts of identity to come to come through to that but it's possible uh, and uh, um, and we will have a drink or two there there before we will break up and uh, we can discuss more more relaxed there as well so thank you to everyone and thanks to the organizers once more uh, 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 Kira and Farida who is midair uh, or at least in the in the internet somewhere thank you very much thank you. Thank you.